All right, well, as I, um, as I mentioned in my prayer, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to return back to the historical context of the confession uh, and tie it together uh, with what's going on in other countries and moving eventually, next week we'll move eventually over to the development of confessionalism into the United States, which brings it up to our, our own history. But before that, I thought I would introduce you to a... Uh, a, a, a little video. Uh, it's 18 minutes long and it's done by uh, Dr. Uh, Chad Van Dixhorn. He, he preached for us one time here and uh, give you, he'll give you another, uh, a, a better historical perspective on the writing of the confession than even I have done and, uh, and help just to, just to summarize things for you. And, uh, and I, I need to say by way of credit that this is coming to you by, from a production that was done by Reformation Heritage, and uh, we'll be using some of their materials this fall when we study Puritans. So, with no further ado, The Westminster Assembly was the high point of the Puritan experiment. It was uh, the answer to many years of prayers on behalf of godly people. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, the, the one time that Puritans seemed to be in, in control of the country. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great story during a tumultuous time of, of uh, English history. The, uh, the assembly came about due to a, a confluence, a, a, a kind of merger of major events. There were political clashes, uh, there were economic problems, uh, and of course there were problems in the church. Uh, Long-running problems uh, that, that trace back to the time of Elizabeth. Um, and then short-term problems due to the aggressive uh, church policies of Archbishop Laud who saw Puritans really as, as enemy number one during the, the 1630s and made life very difficult for them. Uh, many, many members of the Westminster Assembly, maybe about a third of them, end up spending time in jail uh, uh, because they could not escape the long arm of ecclesiastical law. Uh, jail was kind of a sabbatical for Puritans uh, during the, the 1630s and, and, and early 40s. Uh, the Westminster Assembly wouldn't have come about if it, if, if it hadn't been for the fact that Archbishop Laud meddled uh, with the policies of the uh, and practices of the of the Scottish Church, uh, leading uh, Scottish people to be upset enough to invade England, which required the king to try and raise an army, which caused problems in in uh, in, in the English Parliament. And uh, when the, it was clear that the English Parliament didn't really trust the king to raise his own army, he, he tried to get Irish people involved uh, to fight on his side. So, so you've got uh, a conflict involving uh, Scotland, Ireland, uh, England, uh, an, an international conflict with three countries having the same king. So, so each, each one of these countries had foreign armies uh, on their soil, and uh, each one of them ha had a civil war going on at the same time. So a, a complete military mess. Uh, the English Parliament knew that something needed to be done since one aspect of the problem uh, uh, causing the wars was religious. They end up calling an assembly to consult with them, uh, calling members from, uh, ministers from, from different, uh, uh, different counties in England and Wales and uh, they, they gathered together at Westminster Abbey, just across the street from, uh, from, from the Parliament buildings. Westminster Abbey was, at that time, probably the most important symbol, in, in religious symbol as a place in England, conveniently across the street from Parliament, uh, allowed Parliament to kind of keep an eye on this assembly of, of, of theologians. Uh, the assembly uh, first met on uh, July the 1st, 1643, a sermon was held in the Abbey uh, by William Twiss, uh, 
Uh, and uh, lots of people came out uh, to, to watch the opening ceremonies, after which Parliament admitted that it hadn't quite decided yet what the Westminster Assembly was to do. Uh, the Assembly ended up meeting for, for about 1,400 sessions. It met over 10 years. Um, uh, the first thing they did was try to revise the 39 Articles, which seemed like a good project until uh, Scottish theologians joined the Assembly as commissioners uh, representing their church. Uh, they did so because a solemn league and covenant with religious and uh, military dimensions had been signed between the English rebel parliament, now at war with the king, and uh, the Scottish forces who are at war with the king. Scottish Presbyterians at war with the king uh, came to the conclusion that if they could only have a similar set of documents, or an identical set of documents to that of the English church, it would give the English one less reason to meddle in Scottish affairs. So they sent down a, a troop of Scottish theologians and a few lords to sit in the assembly and to, uh, and to, and to meet with Parliament, the English Parliament. Um, so so that, that put an end to, to, to revising the English 39 Articles. The assembly really needed to do something new. And they started that in the autumn of 1643. First, they, they, they dealt with the urgent question of ordination. What, what's it, what, does, what does ordination mean? Um, what offices are there in the church? Should, should the church be ruled by, by bishops or ruling elders? Um, uh, what, what's, what's the job of a pastor? Uh, who, who appoints pastors? That's what they dealt with in the autumn of 1643 into, uh, in, into 1644. And then the assembly turned its attention to worship. Most Puritans had a variety of complaints about the Book of Common Prayer. It was, it was intended uh, uh, to help those who uh, were, were just beginning uh, ministerial life. Uh, it had prayers fully written out. It engaged the congregation. Uh, the Westminster Assembly was, was, was happy to say that all the intentions were right, and yet the way in which the book had been deployed uh, and enforced had, had led to a lot of misery. Also, it, it, it had uh, elements which uh, r really um, offended biblical sensitivities, those who are intent on, on worshiping God according to the requirements of the word, found a number of, of, of items in, in the book objectionable. Bowing to the altar, um, crossing oneself at the, at, the, at the name of Jesus, uh, the requirement that one wear what looked like popish vestments, um, uh, the, the, the ordination by bishops, many, many different features, um, the, the churching of women. I, 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 could, I could go on and on. Uh, there's, there's any number of features which, which, were, which were objectionable. And, and so the assembly decided not to revise it, but to replace it. The Directory for Public Worship was something like a, a do-it-yourself liturgy with all the uh, the, the parts nicely, nicely labeled, um, but which, which one needed to assemble yourself. Uh, there are guides as to what to pray about, what to preach about, um, how to conduct oneself as a, as a leader of worship or, or, or as one worshiping as part of the congregation. It's, it's a book filled with wisdom. And uh, even, the, even the section on preaching, it's just, it's just very rich in the, uh, in the wisdom that it shares in in, in the insight it, it offers into uh, the practice of, of, of preaching and proclaiming God's word. And the assembly finished its directory in 1645. Uh, all the while, it was often engaged in overlapping uh, projects, uh, all the while uh, continuing to work on the subject of, of church government. The, the assembly uh, submitted a platform for church government with, with biblical theological arguments uh, as to why Presbyterianism was the best form of church government against the protests of, of, uh, of Congregationalists principally. The assembly submitted its directory for church government to Parliament in 1646, and Parliament wasn't pleased. It didn't like the doctrinaire uh, assertions. Uh, it, it, it didn't like the biblical exegesis.
Uh, the majority in Parliament did not like to think that Christ had established a particular form of church government. Th they wanted the assembly to make wise recommendations regarding church government and, 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 and then to just have that system of government enforced by parliamentary authority. Uh, the, the assembly was, 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 was not having it. Um, they really did believe uh, that, that the scriptures taught a particular form of government, uh, a government where, where congregations uh, elect, uh, elect their rulers uh, and call their pastors. Um, a, a, a church that is governed um, by elders and, and not, not simply by the people. Uh, most of the members of the assembly thought that if, if, uh, if the people really made most of the decisions, then the elders were just reduced to a committee, effectively, of a congregation. So an elder-led uh, congregation, but, but, but not a, a church government that assumed elders always get it right. Uh, and so they also argued from the scriptures you know, um, Acts 15, Matthew 18, that, that the idea of appeals is, is not only uh, kind of in, intuitive, but biblical. Uh, that, that when elders and pastors make mistakes, that people ought to be able to appeal to a wider body of, of elders and pastors. Um, and and so, so a Presbyterian form of, of, of church government was argued by the assembly and eventually put into action uh, across the nation wherever Loyalty to Parliament was strong enough uh, for that to, for that to happen, uh, but but with without uh, the biblical exegesis and support that the Assembly had offered, uh, they the, the Parliament, Parliament ended up cutting that away, and the Westminster Assembly and other ministers eventually decided to cooperate. Another big issue, not you know, there, there were conflicts in the Assembly between Congregationalists, a small minority of sort of five to ten people, and and the rest of the Assembly another hundred, which didn't always show up on a given day, but attendance often floated around 60 to 80. Um, uh, there's a, there a, not only a conflict within the assembly regarding church government, but also um, uh, on one particular issue, there, there, there are heightened controversies between uh, the Presbyterians in the assembly and parliament itself. A majority in the House of Commons especially, the English parliament has two houses, the House of Commons, House of Lords, um, the House of Lords tended to support most everything the assembly did. You know, they write, they would, the, uh, the assembly would write something and the House of Lords would say, well, that's, that's lovely, let's, let's pass that into law. The House of Commons would usually say, well, look at that. Uh, we don't like this, we don't like that. Uh, when it came to church discipline in particular, uh, the House of Commons was nervous um, a, 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 about what it might mean to discipline someone, even excommunicate someone. Archbishop Laud and his bishops, they, they, they excommunicated people routinely. You just kind of get a letter in the mail or, or, uh, or, or some, some, some official or, or agent of the bishop would, would excommunicate for you know, being behind on your tithes, being critical of the church, whatever it might be. Um, so, so some people wanted to make excommunication as rare as possible. Other people wanted to make it as pastoral as possible. Uh, the, uh, the members of the Westminster Assembly saw church discipline as an opportunity for high-stakes pastoral care. Uh, the members of Parliament saw church discipline as an opportunity for pastors to excommunicate politicians. Uh, and so they had a very different perspective on, on what should be done. Uh, the, the Westminster Assembly said elders and pastors need to make a decision as to you know, who, who comes into the church, whether they have a credible profession of faith. Um, uh, Parliament wanted to, uh, to to set to set up legislation that would indicate what people needed to know and uh, what 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 sins people might commit that would be so bad as to keep them from uh, attending the Lord's Supper. The assembly said, "No way! English people are way too creative in the way that they sin for us to ever come up with a definitive list." Uh, and they, they they went back and forth for months, um, uh, arguing over this. Eventually. Uh, Parliament won. They, they, they got the assembly to create a, a short statement of what people need to believe in order to come to the Lord's table and others be communing members of the church. And uh, they, they dragged out of the assembly a, a list of scandalous sins that could keep people from the table. But of course, no list could be definitive. So Parliament also said that uh, uh, 
uh, if anyone committed a sin not on the list, all a pastor and his elders need to do is to, to write to Parliament and a, uh, and a committee of Parliament at its next regular meeting would discuss the sin and decide whether it was uh, sufficiently scandalous to keep people from the table, and then they would write back to the elders and, and they could take action accordingly. Uh, once again, the Westminster Assembly and the ministers of London uh, protested uh, this kind of an arrangement. But it was better than what they had before. And in the end, they couldn't get anything else out of Parliament. And everyone was committed to the idea that, that if the church was going to, to reform, and since the Church of England was a national church, um, that, that they needed to take as many people along with them as they could. And uh, so, so in the end, once again, uh, elders and ministers more or less cooperated with, with this form of government. Perhaps what the Assembly is most famous for, of course, is its Westminster Confession of Faith, which it completed in 1646. It added proof texts the, the following year. Uh, and uh, also in 1647, had the Assembly produced two catechisms, once again, adding proof texts the, the following year. The, these, these are texts rich in theology, uh, wonderful guides to the Bible. And, um, and I don't think we need to apologize for the age of these texts. It's lovely to have short statements of faith on a website. Um, I suppose they, they remind us of, of, of the freshness and ongoing relevance of, of, uh, of the Christian faith. And, you know, they're, they're like snowflakes. They're pretty, no two are alike. But, but there's something good about a, a solid confession that, that marches topic by topic through what, what the Bible teaches. Um, and a, a good confession has a kind of creedal purpose. It, it unites us to the to saints gone past as well as to, to many people around the world that, that, that share that, that same confession. So I, I, I think that um, uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith has, had a, has, had a, has a strong legacy and an ongoing uh, purpose in, in uniting the church and teaching the church. The catechisms are wonderful tools and they, uh, uh, both the shorter and the larger catechism, uh, lead people through an understanding of who God is and how we need to get to know him and, and, and how, we, how we can be saved by him. Uh, the, the basic structure is uh, to, to ask what we need to, to believe concerning God and, uh, and what, what duty God requires of us, including the, the duty of, of turning to him in repentance and faith uh, and, and calling upon him as our strong and sufficient savior. Having completed the catechisms, the Westminster Assembly didn't have a lot of important work left to do. The one thing it did continue to do is examine ministers. Indeed, from the, from the opening weeks of the assembly, uh, the assembly examined many ministers, uh, about 4,000 of them. Uh, this was an opportunity for Puritans to, um, uh, to vet the, the, the incoming and ongoing ministry in England. Anyone wanting to move from one church to another had to be examined by the assembly, Parliament decided. Uh, an examination could take a couple days, at least. Uh, it required testimonials regarding someone's character, uh, a proof that they had actually had some theological education and so on. Uh, this continued right, right to the, the end of the assembly in, in 1653. But, but most of the members of the assembly left um, in, uh, in, in, in January and uh, the spring of 1649. Uh, the king was beheaded in 49, and, uh, and that's a long story in itself. But most of the Presbyterians said, we went to war to restrain the king, not to kill the king. And they did not want to serve uh, a, a government uh, that, that would uh, continue without a king, without a house of lords. So uh, uh, this, this, this meant that, that, that most of the members of the assembly resigned or, or, or left. Uh, only a handful, most of them congregationalists, carried on the, the work weekly of examining ministers uh, after 1649.
Okay, that's interesting. You never know about computers. <laughs> I do. They're always going to come up with some quirk to make you you get all confident about them and then they say, no, it's not going to be that way. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Well, I hope that that filled in some gaps for you historically, gave you a, an understanding of the context. Um, if we uh, go back and take a look now at our, uh, at our timeline, remember this is three columns and we're moving from, from top to bottom here. The first column has to do with what's going on in the church, and I use italics with that because, of course, as, as, uh, as we just heard, the, the Church of England was basically being replaced, and he mentioned the preoccupation of the assembly to examine ministers. That's because there was no other church governing body to do it. Uh, they had, it was completely gone, and so uh, they took on that. Par what's going on in Parliament, and then of course what's going on in Cromwell, who's coming up and it will uh, result in the Commonwealth after the Civil War. And uh, so just to go over this very quickly, on the left hand side you see the, the red bracket going from 1643 to 1649, that's when the assembly is in session. Previous to that, Presbyterianism uh, was on the rise, and uh, the first English presbytery started in 1572. 1641 was the root and branch petition. That is the petition that was passed by Parliament saying, get rid of the Anglican structure completely, we're going to start all over again, and that's what brought on the, uh, the Assembly's work. Um, the, uh, in Parliament, you've got the Civil War with Charles I starting in 1642, the Solemn League and Covenant is when the uh, Scottish divines come and join the, uh, the assembly. The um, uh, Directory of Worship is adopted in 1644. William Law is executed in 45. The uh, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism is adopted in England by Parliament in 1648. And uh, then over here with Cromwell, he, uh, he is rising in power. Uh, it defeats uh, the armies of Charles I and uh, is there involved in the beheading of Charles in 1649 and takes on the role of Lord Protector in England. So what I want to do now, that's, that should be all reviewed to you by now, so what I want to do is back all the way up to the beginning and focus on 1620 with the story of the Mayflower because although it, has, it, it doesn't it is deal directly with uh, the Westminster uh, Assembly and its history, it will uh, be the uh, beginning, of course, of the transfer of Presbyterianism over into, the, into America. Now, uh, uh, just to remi remind you also, Elizabeth I's reign started in 1559. Uh, she inherited the Anglican Church uh, from Mary and from her father Henry VIII, and the, uh, the church, the Anglican church at, during most of her reign is kind of split between the old Roman Catholics and the rising, uh, the rising increasingly uh, more powerful Reformed and Calvinistic uh, folks, and, but they're divided into two camps. Elizabeth I, you remember, insisted on the, uh, I'm the head of the church, just like Dad was, and uh, so she kept that uh, authoritative monarchical role over, rule over the church. Uh, there were those who uh, could abide by that, said, okay, we'll accept that for now, and they were called the conforming uh, Puritans and Presbyterians. And uh, they, that is the group uh, which basically consisted of the Westminster divines. So the divines come from the conforming side, say, as you, as you heard uh, uh, Van Dixhorn say that, you know, one of the objections they had at the end was, you, you, you killed the king. Uh, we, we weren't here to get rid of the king. Uh, and so they had some objections. So the, those who were uh, persuaded of monarchical government and oversight over the church uh, are the ones consisting of the divines, and that tells us why. Uh, 
when we studied the chapter on the magistrate, that that was clearly in, in, the, in the writing, and that that's one of the chapters that had to be changed when uh, it came over to the, United, for, uh, to the uh, colonies. But there was another group, and they were called the nonconformists. They were the ones who rejected Elizabeth as the head of the church, but they also were split into factions, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Separatists, Independents. These were the ones who would be uh, prosecuted by the government if found and thrown in a jail, and, uh, and these are the ones that were the most harassed. They are the ones which, consist, which make up the pilgrims, the pilgrims be, being a term uh, that is going to be used uh, to refer to those who will cross the Atlantic um, a little later on. Now, toward the end, to add to the mix, remember, toward the end of Elizabeth's reign, in, uh, in 1595, Jacobus Arminius in, ne in the Netherlands is spreading his uh, anti-Calvinistic uh, understanding of uh, theology, and that is spreading into England toward the end of that reign, so that when James I takes charge after Elizabeth's death, he, even though he's Scottish and even though he's raised in the Presbyterian Church, he now is king and he wants his power. Thank you very much. And so he rejects uh, Presbyterianism for uh, Anglicanism. He said, I really do prefer Anglicanism. And he also, because of the influence and the power of Calvinism, he says, I'm going towards Arminianism. And so he was just kind of throwing all kinds of smoke bombs up to keep uh, the Puritans at bay. But uh, so the separatists, the ones at the bottom of that il illustration, eventually have had enough by that time, and, by, and in 1607 and 1608, they get into a boat, and they sail across the English Channel to the Netherlands, where they think that they will be able to practice religious freedom. Uh, they've been, they are the ones being persecuted in England, remember, and so they say, we, you know, we want to be able to practice our religion freely. They go to the Netherlands. That doesn't work out as well as they hoped it would, and so by 1620, they uh, arrange to be the occupants and the experimental guinea pigs, if you will, of, uh, of those uh, uh, investors who were interested in starting something in the New World. And so they get aboard two boats. One is called the Mayflower, the other is the Speedwell. And they sail out of the harbor of Netherlands, cross the English Channel, and head out to sea to uh, the United States. Um, now, the, 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 tra the trip did not go very smoothly for them. The Speedwell sprung a leak three times, had to, be, had to return to base three times. They both had to return three times. It, the uh, story of those leaks are very suspicious. <laughs> One story goes is the captain didn't want to make the trip, and so he made the boat leak. <laughs> Uh, but after three times, they decided to not go with the Speedwell and could only take on 20 more from the Speedwell onto the Mayflower. And so they, for, they were very crowded with 85 travelers on board the Mayflower, and their journey took 10 weeks. And so it was a miserable trip. Um, to, to, inspire, uh, to add to that, they, arrived, they aimed for Virginia in the south, but wound up, because of storms, uh, they wound up landing in Cape Cod. This is, um, this is the, the history, by the way, that's being defied and destroyed by the 1619 Project, which uh, is trying to tell us that, uh, that even this is um, built on a premise of slavery, which is absolute deceit and manipulation and lie. Um, before they depart, their own arguments with one another about how things are going to go force them to do a rather brilliant thing. They sit down and they write out a form of government that all will promise to abide by, and it's called the Mayflower Compact. And it becomes one of the, again, one of the great contributions to, uh, to democracy in the New World. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a long time coming. You remember the the, uh, the, 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 the covenant in, in uh, Scotland was probably the beginning of this. Uh, the uh, Westminster uh, had some influence, but the Mayflower Compact, there. so the, the whole idea of building a democracy or a democratic government uh, 
is building uh, not only in reality but in popularity in the new world. So we uh, go back to uh, this, uh, this um, uh, timeline again. We, uh, the Mayflower sails in 1620, uh, but then uh, the Westminster is written by 1649. Uh, Charles I is beheaded, and England becomes a commonwealth during the rest of the life of, of, uh, of Cromwell in, uh, between 1653 and 1658. And, uh, and it's, in six, it's toward the end of that period, uh, that, that 1648, when, when Parliament actually adopts the Westminster Confession. Uh, Scotland uh, adopts it earlier by one year, but England's Parliament does the same thing. They accept it. Uh, and, but that's just prior to the beginning of the Commonwealth and all that will go on there. Now, in that ba about the same time England is, uh, is accepting the Westminster, back over in New England in 1648, there is a group of Congregationalists. Remember, the, the, these groups, are the, the people in the Mayflower were very split uh, in terms of church government primarily. You had your Presbyterians, but you had your Congregationalists. The Congregationalists are the one had the loudest voice after the Mayflower landed, and, the, and there was a declaration of, of uh, the gathering in Cambridge to write what was called the Cambridge Platform in 1648, and it was a declaration of congregational church government in the churches of colonial New England. It did embrace the Westminster Confession. It liked the, they liked the doctrine, they liked the systematic uh, survey, but they did not like the Presbyterian uh, influence, and so they made changes in the, pre in, in, the, uh, in the Westminster Confession to suit themselves, and, uh, and as you see, Richard Mather and John Cotton were among the Puritans there having to do that. So uh, congregationalism starts very strong in New England in the early days pro following this 1648 Cambridge platform. Now, the warnings, do you remember, remember what, what uh, Van Dixhorn said? Right of appeal is, not, is, is one of the strengths and arguments of Presbyterianism. That if there is a, a change in doctrine at a local church level, uh, that can be appealed to Presbytery. Presbytery can be appealed to General Assembly. And so there is a checks and balances. There is a mutual accountability among Presbyterian churches that on paper, at least, is designed to keep the church together. And when the Congregationalists abandon that sense of, of uh, checks and balances and made each effectively each congregation independent of all other churches, it opens the door for, uh, for the, that kind of uh, misdirection to take place whenever strong personalities come up or whatever sins might develop, uh, what have you. Um, a congregational church uh, in, the, in the Cambridge platform is stated can function under a mixed, a variety of governmental approaches. Uh, it does embrace the monarchy. King Jesus is king of the church and that's not, a, that's not an issue. It also says the church is a democracy. There is congregational governance choosing and deposing officers, admitting members, exercising public censure, excommunication, restoration. That's the job of the congregation, not of the officers. And there is also, but there is also an aristocracy. There is a rule of normal operations and guidelines that are done by the ministers, the elders, and deacons. Um, and, and the point is, each congregation is distinct and without authority over one another, but should maintain communion with one another. If you know anything about, let's see if I bring this up, no. If you know anything about what happens in New England following that Cambridge platform is that those very things become barriers to holding others accountable and New England falls deeply into Unitarianism for, the, for, for going forward and, and, we, and it's, 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 it's completely abandons the the, the Christian faith in that regard. Meanwhile, over in Scotland, 
As I said, uh, the Westminster Confession is embraced in Scotland a year ahead of that, uh, uh, that it does in, in, uh, in England. The, the larger and shorter catechisms are adopted. The, ca the, cate the confession is ratified by Parliament. Scottish Scotland is all in. No problem here. We want this. And so Scotland embraces the standards of the assembly wholeheartedly and still do. Um, however, things in, Scot in England are changing rapidly. Uh, with the death of Cromwell is also the death of the Commonwealth experiment. Uh, there is no strong hand at the helm now, and uh, the political landscape has changed. Uh, and the bottom line is, is that uh, Charles II, uh, the son of Charles I, is invited back to take the monarchy in England once again. Charles II, of course, comes, uh, welcomes the, uh, the, the opportunity, he comes back to the throne, and he first thing he wants to do is settle scores with his dad's murderers. Lots of heads fall, uh, but more than that, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, well, yeah. Directory of um, family, worship. family worship, yes. Let me, yeah, let me make sure. Okay, yeah. Before we go any farther, 1658 is when Cromwell dies, and then this transition between um, Cromwell and Charles I takes place. Uh, at the same time, in England, there's another uh, gathering of ministers. This is just, uh, just 10 years after the, after the assembly. This takes place at Savoy Palace in London. The, uh, the independents and the Congregationalists who are in London all know what happened in, in, in uh, the Americas, in Cambridge, and they say, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it also. And so it doesn't take long before the confession starts to be chopped up and changed and adapted to suit just anybody's kind of whim and will. And that's a, that's a big shame. Um, in 1658, the Savoy Declaration of Faith and Order is written, Independence, Congregationalist version uh, of the Westminster. Uh, it's attended by a hundred laymen over a hundred independent churches. Uh, it's led by uh, Thomas Goodwin and John Owen, very, very famous uh, Puritans. Uh, they met for two weeks. And after adopting a few alterations of doctrinal definitions of the confession, but restructuring the part of it related to the church government, uh, they, uh, they basically embraced the Cambridge fat platform and said, we call it the Savoy uh, Declaration. And so independency has its own, its own confession of faith, and, uh, and they can go forward. Now, uh, back, back with the uh, timeline. What's going on in England is the atmosphere is changing. You remember that even as, as Van Dixhorn said, the independents were always say, raising their hackles about the Presbyterians who uh, were in the majority of the assembly, saying, we, we think this church government thing's a problem, we don't like it, we don't like it, we don't like it. And the, but the, by the writing of the, of, the, of the confession was controlled by the Presbyterians. And, uh, but that tune changed, and the, uh, during the Commonwealth, religious toleration tipped the scales against the Presbyterians. And that was primarily Commonwe uh, Cromwell's doing. He was not a Presbyterian, he was a Congregationalist. Uh, Presbyterianism, which started in 1758 with the first Presbytery meeting, could have been the church government in England if it had not been for Cromwell. But Cromwell really kind of put the kibosh on it because he favored uh, independency and he favored congregationalism. He dies in 1658 when the uh, Savoy Doctrine is, is written. Uh, Charles II returns. He begins his wrath of restructuring. One of the first things he does, of course, is he gets rid of the Westminster Standards. The Westminster Standards are nullified and they're officially burned. This no longer applies and that's why even today in England uh, if you a uh, Presbyterian, if you're Reformed Presbyterian, you go take a tour through Westminster Abbey, you know, there is no mention whatsoever of the, of the assembly. They are not interested in telling you anything about that. And um, uh, it's just not a part of their history. 
and uh, so there, the, the Westminster Standards are nullified and destroyed. Uh, in 1662, the, uh, yet another act of uniformity is passed. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer is put back into place. You must worship according to the Book of Common Prayer. You must do this. You must do that. You may not worship in any other way. Uh, in 1664 is the Conventicle Act, which means that a gathering of five or more is required to use the Book of Common Prayer. Any nonconformist ministers now are driven out of their pulpits, may not live within five miles of the city. And, of course, that today doesn't sound very mad, but when you're going by horse, it's, it's a long journey. Um, and, uh, and in 1673 is the Test Act requiring religious compliance by military officers. They don't want the military officers assigned to enforce this to start to waffle and say, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a nonconformist. In my, I'm, they, want, they want the military complying so that they know they'll take care of it. It is during the time here that we're talking about, Charles II, that John Bunyan is arrested, he is thrown into jail, he is a nonconformist Baptist minister, and that is when he writes Pilgrim's Progress. And it's also at the same time when John Milton writes Paradise Lost. He was not a young man at the time, by the way. Um, now, that was independents and Congregationalists. We come to the Baptists. Uh, the Baptists are a curious lot, historically, and I am not going to try to explain this to you. But as you can see, the Baptists are, for four centuries, are very preoccupied in writing and rewriting Confessions of Faith. Um, it could be that there, I really don't know, so I am only speculating, it could be that Baptists um, saw the need to be current and relevant and contemporary. Maybe they built into each statement, you know, what we do with this issue today. Uh, I, I, that's just a guess on my part. It, but it also has to do with their streak of independency. Baptists are probably worse than Congregationalists when it comes to not having anything to do with any other church. Uh, they are on their own. And so, their collection just goes, you know, on and on and on, and each one of them, I'm sure, is written with a definitive stamp on it, saying this is, this is our defined Baptist stance, and we don't need to improve it, and then the next day, yeah, we need to improve this. So, uh, they also write uh, greater statements of faith that they do by convention and association. You know, they don't have presbyteries, they don't have general assemblies, because that speaks of Presbyterian accountability. So Baptists have conventions. They get together, uh, they say, hi, how are you? Don't tell me how to run my shop. But they do get together at, a, at such associ uh, associations and conventions, and they try to speak for the whole. So whereas these are more specific geographical statements having to, uh, of each individual church, perhaps, there are efforts that are made uh, in the history of the Baptist Church to speak, this is where we together stand. But again, you can see that they're never, they never seem to be satisfied. Um, I say that not because I'm picking on them or because I'm picking on anybody else. But, um, I, you know, and, I, and of course it's easy for me to say because I'm a Presbyterian. But... Uh, the confession, in, to my mind, in spite of the fact that it might be Presbyterian and not Baptistic and not Congregational, as I said at the very beginning, is very, very close to inspired. Uh, and, of course, when I'm in a church setting, that word is dangerous. If I step outside the walls and I say, Mozart was inspired, you would agree with me. And that's the kind of use I'm using here. I think that the Lord is, this is not inerrant, this is not infallible, it's not compared to Scripture, but it is once in a millennium kind of thing that is done. And I just personally think more effort should have been made to kind of stick with the program rather than start chopping it up and manipulating it uh, as, soon as, as soon as these churches did. Two significant 
uh, Baptist revisions of the Westminster Confession that, uh, that are important here. Uh, in 1689 was the Second London Baptist Confession. This was written particularly, particularly, <laughs> written by particular Baptists, excuse me, who embraced a Calvinistic soteriology, so the Westminster Confession was just fine by them in that regard. Um, it's based on the Westminster Confession. It's also based on the Savoy. That was the one that was written in, in England uh, as Congregationalists. They, they, they draw from the change. They started with the Confession. They drew from some of the changes in the Savoy. And then they modified it to suit their Baptistic views, which means, of course, that it destroyed the whole covenantal structure and, and everything having to do with that. And, of course, of course, baptism, the chapter on baptism. And then you cross the Atlantic, and in 1742, they passed the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, which is basically just a transplant of the Second London. And, uh, but it made allowance for uh, things that, uh, for other things that they wanted to do, which is perfectly fine. Uh, they made allowance for the singing of hymns as opposed to the singing just of psalms. Uh, and, uh, and other, other things, spiritual songs, you know, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, particularly during the Lord's Supper. So the process of how you uh, do the Lord's Supper is, uh, is in view here. And of course, they're following also the directory for public worship, not the Book of Common Order. So they have freedom to do it anyway, but, uh, but I guess they felt the need to uh, say that, okay, we're going to broaden the, the singing aspect of that. And then very curiously, and I don't know, have any explanation for this, um, the uh, laying on of hands at baptism. I guess by the minister is what they're talking about. Is made optional. I don't know why. Okay, that's as far as we're going to get today. Next week we're going to start there and we're going to go forward with the development of Presbyterianism in the United States. Any questions about any of this? <laughs> I know, you're all sick and tired right now, right? <laughs> all right, let's pray. Father, I thank you very much for the patience of these students. And uh, Lord, bless us as we continue to uh, seek the truth that is in the Word of God. And we thank you for it. And as we see the work that has been done by uh, by mere men uh, who love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, even though we might disagree on various issues, that, uh, Lord, there is a reason why we can all hark back to the writing of the Westminster Confession, whether we're Congregationalists or whether we're Baptists or whether we're independence, whether we're in England, whether we're in America, we trace those roots back to this amazing document. And we're, therefore, we all thank you for it. And we pray that uh, you would continue to bless your church as she continues to draw on it for her strength and for her um, identity. And we ask now that you would help us to uh, prepare our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen.